everybody. We got a great one today. You know, for a change, we're repeating my conversation with Norman Lear. I did a couple years ago. Norman died today. I, I knew Norman. I had uh, met him uh, through my comedy friends and uh, from politics. Uh, Norman founded People for the American Way as a counter to the far-right Christian nationalists, the Pat Robertsons and the Jerry Falwells. You know Norman as the creator of All in the Family and so many popular shows of uh, sitcoms in the 70s and the 80s mainly, although he was producing stuff to the end. I, I, I was honored to be part of Norman's 100th birthday celebration, which was a special on, on ABC. And sitting in this big room at the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood, you got an understanding of the impact that he had on TV and America. Uh, the music, uh, much of it, which came uh, from uh, shows with black cast like the Jeffersons, uh, moving on up to the east side, uh, Good Times with Jimmy Walker, Sanford and Son. Of course, the biggest hit was All in the Family, which changed TV. It was a show where Carol O'Connor, as Archie, argued with the son, Michael Stivak, I think was his name. Uh, that's uh, Rob Reiner. And uh, Archie called him uh, you Pollock, I believe, as I remember. As uh, and, and, and Rob played a very liberal anti-war uh, son-in-law. I don't want to go through every show. There's too many of them. But Maud, a, uh, which was a spinoff from All in the Family, and you may remember there was a two-part episode uh, where Maud decided, painfully, uh, decided to get an abortion. This was real stuff in, in the 70s. These were shot in front of a live audience. They, they were known as three-camera sitcoms. Uh, the key was the audience. You, you hear Norman say in the podcast that there's nothing better than hearing a studio audience roar with laughter and i agree i don't want to take too long on this intro i just want to add what a lovely wise gentleman norman lear was and you'll get unanimous i think agreement on that he was something lived a very full life including flying 52 missions in world war ii uh and 70 in world war one no, he was, Norman wasn't that old, but he was 101. So here goes. Uh, I think you'll enjoy this one with my guest, Norman Lear, a great one for a change. Okay, let's start with, um, I, your dad was, it went to like prison, right? Or something? He did. He, he did. Uh, when I was nine years old, he uh, tried to sell some fake bonds, or that's about what I understood at that time. And he served three years on Deer Island off the coast of um, Boston. And was that formative in any way, or was it just a bummer? Or uh, <laughs> uh, how did that affect your mom, and did it affect your comedy? Did it affect your whole point of view it affected my uh, it, it certainly affected my comedy a good deal uh how my mother was a we were living in chelsea mass i'm nine years old my mother is ashamed to be living where we're living and there are strangers in the house it's two days after they took my father away and one stranger is looking and talking to my mother about buying his red leather chair which was the most precious item of furniture in my life because I used to sit in that red leather chair in Ottoman with my dad on Friday nights and listen to the, uh, to the fights from Madison Square Garden. I never, if I lived to be a thousand, and I'd like that, uh, I could never forget that. Well, you're one-tenth of the way there almost. So this stranger puts his hand on my shoulder and and he said, well, Norman, you're the man in the house now. <laughs> oh, Somehow, I knew, I knew that was funny. You knew that was funny at nine? <laughs> okay, he meant it seriously, but you th thought it was really funny. In the most dire way. I <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Well, I think you were. Yes. That. <laughs> so you basically saw things funny from the start. And that wasn't the first time. <laughs> you're the man. Of the, you're the man of the house now. Uh, yeah. Well, Norman, you're the man of the house now. <laughs> <laughs> and you were nine. My, my father had just been taken away. I was. <laughs> <laughs> and that was so helpful. He was being helpful, you know. Yeah, well, it was certainly helpful years later when I realized more and more how funny it was. Okay, well, jump ahead. Well, I'm going to jump around, but I know you wrote a lot for Martin and Lewis, right? Yes. We had done the Jack Haley show. You and Ed Simmons. That was our first television show. We were in New York. It was in New York. We did it. Jerry Lewis saw a sketch on it and thought, oh, my God, he could have done that a lot better than Jack Haley. And uh, he asked to see meet those writers. And we did the first three years of the Martin and Lewis Colgate Comedy Hour. I just got to ask you what it was like working for Martin and Lewis, uh, particularly Lewis, but also Martin. <laughs> so Martin and Lewis, what was it like working for Martin and Lewis? It was uh, it was glorious uh, at the beginning. Jerry was uh, hilarious <laughs> and uh, and dear, very very dear. And he grew to be uh, uh, kind of the Pope. He, over time, grew to know everything and every everything about everything. And, and it was very, very difficult with him. Yeah, he became like the auteur that had to grind his own lenses, kind of, Jerry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, it was amazing how he became... Something 180 degrees from the dear kid he was when we started. And how quickly was that? Because, I mean, obviously that was fame and success and... and... It stretched out over a couple of years. Okay. Uh, so uh, now I'm going to back up again. So we're not going chronologically, but we kind of are. World War II. Yeah. I want to thank you. I want to, on, on behalf of the mediocre generation, I'd like to thank uh, those of you in the greatest thank you, thank generation you. who saved, uh, you know, mankind. So thank you for that. Welcome and thank you. It's hard to believe that all of that happened in the same lifetime. You were on a bomber, right? Yes, I was on a B-17 known as the Flying Fortress. And did missions over, you were out of Italy, were you? I got uh, out of Foggia, Italy, yeah. I got credit for 52 missions and actually dropped bombs uh, 35 times. And your job was uh, was radio? radio? And I had the top gun. That's dangerous. That was dangerous. (laughs) (laughs) Did you know that? (laughs) Did anyone tell you? The guy was telling me it was dangerous. I, I wasn't. I hadn't really noticed all the Messerschmitts in the air and the uh, and the missiles from the ground. I really didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> man, oh man! So that's. Um, I imagine that you may be the last of your crew around. Is that? I am. Accurate? I am the last of my crew. Yeah. But what's interesting is, is you know, we do a, a pretty political show here, but uh, also we have uh, people from comedy, and you've bridged both. Uh, we like to have people who have bridged both, um, which I like to think I have. And, um, you know, you form people for the American way, and it was named that for a reason. Am I right? Uh, yes, it was. You know, I didn't... Uh, wake up any morning of my life and say, I'm going to start an organization. What happened was I was watching the Jerry Falwells and Pat Robertsons and Jimmy Swaggerts and the other religious right figures on radio and some on television mixing politics and religion. And uh, I knew that was antithetical to my understanding of the Constitution and the American way. And, and so what I did was uh, I wrote a uh, and cast a uh, one-minute PSA of a working guy on a piece of uh, uh, tractor equipment 
the camera panned in uh, and it pushed in on him as he said, uh, you know, he and his wife and kids sit around the dinner table and talk about politics all the time, and they disagree about many, many things. But now here come some ministers on radio and television telling him, this is the way to think, and if you don't think this way, you're un-American. And uh, he's learning all the time from these guys that he's un-American. Oh, no, that he's the full American at the table, and his wife is un-American. And he mm-hmm. knows his wife is the smartest person he uh, he's met. At, he def- in defending her, he finds his own point of view must be off somehow. Uh, because he winds up saying that's not the the American way. Mixing politics and religion is not the American way. What year did you do that ad? Uh, 1973 or four. I want to cut to uh, 9-11. Do you remember what Falwell and Roberts were on together and what they, what they said about you and others about 9-11? No, refresh me. Okay, this is Falwell. I really believe that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, people for the American way, all of them who have tried to secularize America, I put my finger in their face and say, you help this happen. And Robertson said, well, I totally concur. (laughs) <laughs> you sounded like him for that moment <laughs> i used to do robertson uh because cause he was like a happy christian you know that yes yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> but these guys that was so pernicious you know martin luther king mixed religion <laughs> with politics but he did it in a very 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 different way and so is Raphael warnock who obviously is, you know, yes, this is from the same church. I mean, a minister at the same church. And the people from the American Way really took these guys on, the Falwells and the Robertsons, and we're still, it's, it, we're, we're still living with that. We're still living with that divide. We see it very starkly of the evangelical right. Mm-hmm. which uh, had its uh, control of the judges, which is uh, something I saw firsthand, and that is pernicious. Okay, so uh, I want to get back to how you got to Hollywood. You went to Emerson College. By the way, our engineer, I'm in New York right now, and the engineer here, Sam, uh, Samantha, is um, she went to Emerson, too, oh. and said that, you endowed the school for kids who were in need. So I've, she thanks you. I've, I've helped. I love Emerson. I wonder if she, is she listening to this? She is. I wonder yes. if, if this lasted, this song at that time when I went to Emerson. Emerson is marching, follow the lead. Of all the things you've done in show business, singing was not one of them. Uh, <laughs> no, there's nothing I wish to do more. I can't imagine anything lovelier by way of uh, earning one's living, spending one's life, than uh, looking into the faces you're singing for, singing to the appreciation, for the appreciation of a crowd. Well, how about making them laugh? Making them laugh. Standing behind an audience when they are guffawing, when you're looking at several hundred people in bleachers and uh, they guffaw, they belly laugh. They tend to come out of their seats a little, their bodies move forward and then their bodies move back into the seat again. And in my life, I've never known a more spiritual, divine moment than watching several hundred people go for. And that's your studio audience. You shot on video. 
Yes. And you shot three, you were what's called three camera. Always live in front of a studio audience. And, uh, yeah, I, I can testify to that. Uh, an audience laughing is really, there's, boy, oh boy, there's almost nothing better. Nothing, nothing. Okay, so you get you you uh, you leave Emerson. You don't graduate from Emerson, right? Right. And because you go to the war, you go to the war. I, I, en I enlisted. Yeah, we were uh, at nine eleven. We were rehearsing a play called Two Orphans" behind one thirty Beacon Street on the Esplanade, and uh, somebody came running down a fire escape to say. They had just fired on Pearl Harbor. I'll never forget that moment. Um, the director of this piece, Two Orphans, was named Gertrude Binley Kay. And she talked like this. She was a Boston Brahmin who talked <laughs> like We loved her. I don't mean to make fun of her at all. That's her sound. She wanted to go down. She Her immediate reaction was to go down to Boylston Street and throw some rocks into this Japanese antiques shop. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't think, you know, if anybody had wished to do it, she would have done it. But 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 that was her reflexive reaction. I can never forget. So you uh you enlisted or you uh... I I called my folks the next day or that day and said I was enlisting my mother told me she would die if I did. Please beg me, beg me, and I didn't. But it wasn't a year before I could handle it anymore, and and I had to tell her I was doing it, and I enlisted. And and uh, hence the fifty some uh, some missions. You yeah. get out, and uh, how do you get into show business? I had an uncle who was a press agent. Okay. Actually, what I wanted to be when I was a kid was a press agent because my uncle Jack used to flick me a quarter every time he saw me. I don't know how many times, 10, 12 times that he saw me over the years, but he flicked me a quarter. That was my role model. I wanted to be an uncle who could flick a quarter. He said he was a press agent. I wanted to be a press agent. And when I was, uh, when as the war ended, I was still overseas. And uh, I wrote a letter and sent it to my Uncle Jack. And he sent it out to a number. Of, I, I just wrote that I was a GI. I just finished flying some missions. And I was coming home. All my life wanted to be a press agent like my Uncle Jack and so forth. And... Uh, I got one offer in the mail as a, a job and one offer as an interview. And uh, I, I took the job. It, it was, I think it was a smart choice because if you had gone to the interview, you might not, I might not be talking to you because you may not have ever done any any shows. <laughs> 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 Who knows? Uh, so, okay, does that get you out to L.A. being a press agent? Uh, well, what we did in those, you know, there was a Danton Walker and a Louis Sobel and a Walter Winchell and a Leonard Lyons and there were Dorothy Kilgallen. And we wrote, you know, what we hoped were witticisms for our clients. Uh, Moss Hart, Kitty Carlisle gifted, I wrote this and, and Dorothy Kilgallen uh, printed it that uh, Kitty Carlisle gifted Moss Hart with a pocket flask measured to his hip while he slept. <laughs> <laughs> while he napped. I see, I see. So that was a press agent then, was right. It's like writing tweets. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's what you were doing. And they were printed by uh, the columnists I mentioned, and that was my job. Okay, so is that is that a publicist? Is that what you are, a press agent, as a publicist? I came out to California to be a publicist and uh, met Ed Simmons, who wanted to be a, a comedy writer. And you two became a writing team. Our wives went to a movie one night. We were babysitting, <laughs> and we wrote something together. When, it, when they came home from the movies at 10.30 or so, I said, why don't we go out and see if we can sell this? 
there was a place called the Bar Music not far away. And I used to remember her name. She played the piano and told jokes. And we sold it to her for $40. Pretty good. $20 was about a third of what I made selling door to door in those years. So So you were kind press agent, kind of door to door salesman? Yeah. Okay. So, so that's that's the beginning. It's just the uh, your your wives go out to a movie and you decide to write something, <laughs> and then you sell it, and bam, you're writing for Martin and Lewis, and then uh, yeah, you, we, you, we I wrote something for Danny Thomas. Man, uh, I love Danny Thomas. I got a telephone number from uh, <laughs> uh, a woman I know who was the uh, secretary for the agent who was Danny Thomas's agent. Through her, I got Danny's number. And I called him and told him I was uh, a writer and I had an idea for him. And uh, he thought I said, I had a piece of material and he was working with Wally Pop. That was his accompanist. God, I can't re- believe I remember that name. Okay. With- <laughs> Wally Pop. Well, he was working with his accompanist because he was doing a bit the next night uh, at Ciro's and it would be a crowd that knew his material and knew a lot about his work and so forth. He he hoped he could find a four minute thing that he could do the very next night. I said, I've got that idea. And he said, okay, get over here. I said, uh, I'll be there in about three hours. (laughs) He said, you said you're in Hollywood. I'm in Beverly Hills. You get over here. You'll be here in 20 minutes. But I hadn't written this thing. It was just an idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I... uh, he said, all right, I'll get over here by 4 o'clock or something like that. And he did it the next night. I I was standing in the kitchen at Ciro's, and he he did well. You know, he was great. Next thing I knew, we I had an offer to come to New York and write. Oh, so now you're in L.A., then you go back to New York to write. Yeah. Okay. And eventually, and that that's where you met Martin and Lewis, or that's where you met Jack Haley? or where? I went back east to do the Jack Haley show. Okay. And that's how I met Martin and Lewis, because Jerry was coming on the television in the Colgate Comedy Hour. He saw it. A sketch I'd written. The one he thought he could uh, have done yeah. better than Haley, even better than Haley. Yeah. So now you're 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 in it. You're in show business, really in show business. You're writing, uh, uh, you're like head writers for the TV show. Either that or what producers. We were the head writers for the Colgate Comedy Hour, starring Martin and Lewis. Okay, I got you. So now you're big time. You're there. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and now, and then, then boom, how many years later, what are we talking about now? 70? <laughs> years later? 70 years later? Uh, you're still uh, still writing, you're still, but, but and you do a, a number of things. I know, uh, you know, I, 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 you did Divorce American Style, was that, that a movie that you wrote? Yes, yes, yes. Divorce American Style. I loved it. <laughs> it was actually, I I think I remember seeing that, like, in, what was it, 1960 or something, or 61 or? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, of course, the big deal, the big, unbelievable breakthrough in terms of not just your career, but American culture, is all in the family. And that's 50 years now, right? Yeah. 50 years ago. But this is the 50-year celebration, yeah. Yeah, 71, and it was like, I think in January 71. Yeah. And, you know, you were able to do political, well, uh, and social satire, uh, which I don't believe had been done. Had it? Um, you know, my answer to these questions are from what I've read <laughs> <laughs> over the years. Uh, I, I'm not sure I knew it had never been done when it, when we did it, but I've read over the years that, it, yeah, it was... Not in a sitcom. I mean, that was the week that was, was a, a satirical show, a news show. The Smothers Brothers. And the Smothers Brothers as well. 
absolutely. Yeah, they, they came close. No, they did. They did absolutely nail on the head. They, they were kicked off the air because they did nail on the head political yeah, stuff. Uh, yes, they were kicked about off About Vietnam. The yeah, no, no, they were, that's, they were gone. Yeah. Uh, you created Archie Bunker. You created this uh, lovable bigot. Is that fair to say? It's fair to say. That's what everybody called him. And uh, then Meathead, Rob Reiner, is sort of the uh, the progressive in the house, the liberal, and that tension is there always. That's built yeah, into the show. Rob Reiner since he and my oldest daughter were six years old. When Carl and I lived uh, about three houses apart on Fire Island for a couple of summers. Mm -hmm. We became fast friends, and so I knew Rob as a little boy. Carl, hard not to be a friend of Carl Reiner's. I count myself as one um, in the last uh, number of years. Uh, whenever I get to L.A., I would go to his house. I would make sure I'd call him up. And he was at home. He was at home. home. Yeah. And you could just say, Carl, you, can I come over? And I come over, and he was so nice. I'd bring members of my staff, my Senate staff, over. And my God. And one night I had dinner with Mel Brooks and him, uh -huh. just the three of us. And that was pretty Pretty good. I dine out on that a lot. That's much better than, uh, yeah, I had dinner with uh, Ted Cruz. I had a friend who owned Caesar's Palace for a, a couple of years. I knew him well. And he called me one day and he said, you know, we have a house in Palm Springs and another one in La Costa. They each have five bedrooms. They're fully staffed, you know, and, and they're not used every weekend. Some weekend, if you're free, call the office and see if one of them are open. I did that, and the house in Palm Springs was open. I called Carl and Mel, Larry Gelbart, who was yep. the greatest of the comedy writers. All, all these guys are in your show of shows and Sid Caesar's. Yes, show. and uh, John DeLuise, and uh, we were five couples. We went down to Palm Springs, and that resulted in about six years of Palm Springs and La Costa every year. The the same five couples. The, there were there were weekends when we'd arrive on Friday night, get up and have breakfast in our bed clothes on Saturday, and get out of our bed clothes Sunday night to go home. <laughs> That's how much we laughed. Boy, oh boy! And you didn't tape it, you. Asshole. <laughs> I don't think we were taping that way then. Of and, course not. Of course not. And you could retire, and Carl, Norman, uh, if you had those tapes. <laughs> Larry Gilbart came out of, uh, he had some work to do. He came out of the bedroom one afternoon and said he took some time and wrote a song for us. Uh, we called ourselves Yenemfeld, which is Yiddish for the other world. And so uh, we all sang, and then that became something we had to do, sitting at the table for every meal before we ate. <laughs> oh, Yenemveld, oh, Yenemveld, oh, Yenemveld, oh, Yenemveld. That was it, oh, Yenemveld. That was it? That was so it. So it was O oh, Tannenbaum, but yeah. you put in Yenemveld? Yenemveld. And you know what I'm, I'm thinking? You guys weren't very funny. <laughs> that group. <laughs> it didn't matter because we thought we were. I know. Well, you know, you thought you were funny, but Larry Gelbart, Kyle Reiner, Mel Brooks, Norman Lear, Don DeLuise. Eh. 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 <laughs> Annie Bancroft was no slouch also. That's Anne Bancroft, great actress, and, and Mel's wife. Uh, okay, let's, uh, okay, so All in the Family uh, wasn't a hit right out of the bat, right? Right out of the gate. It took some weeks. It was uh, in about six weeks. It okay. started to move <laughs> up. That's uh, pretty I fast. I wouldn't call it a hit, but enough to be picked up for the following season. Right, and then, then it was the number one show for, I don't know, what, five right. years or something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and then, of course... Sanford and Son, and uh, just uh, the slew of huge, huge hits. 
that you had good times. Uh, Maud. Maud, Maud. Uh, and how many of these were spinoffs of spinoffs? Was Maud a spinoff of all in the... No, it wasn't, was it? Maud was based... Well, it wasn't a spinoff in the sense that I brought B. Arthur out knowing that if she did this role, they would all ask for her to do a television show. I didn't have the Maud in mind and so forth, but I knew that B. Arthur wasn't going to do this guest shot without some phone calls. She, you got to build a show around her. Wow. Because she was hilarious and the role was perfect. Archie had been on the air for a little while, and I, I wanted somebody that could put him down, really tower over him and, and nail him. And uh, remembering my own family life, I knew there was nothing like an old neighbor, uh, an old relative with a grudge. <laughs> Somebody who wasn't invited to Gert's wedding 22 years ago. You know, that kind of a grudge. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> the, the author came on All in the Family as a cousin of Edith's that she hadn't seen for 25 years. So they were kids together. But she knew Edith when she met Archie and was totally against the marriage. So she came in with that grudge. And she was wonderful. And uh, I, 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 I didn't get home that night before I had a phone call because the show was earlier in New York uh, saying, you've got to do something with that woman. <laughs> and you did. And now that, of course, had the controversial uh, Maud Gets an Abortion Yes. Uh, yeah. Episode. And um, do, you th do you think that you can do what you're doing then now or you can't? Or what's the difference? Well, I've been doing uh, One Day at a Time with Rita Moreno and Justina Machado, a, a Latino version of it. Right, right. Uh, last, up to last season, we did, we did four years. I saw an episode where the census taker came, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> which was very funny. But we had a great time. And there wasn't anything we wished to do that we fought over in terms of the network saying you can't do it. It was we were wide open. Good, good. What do you what do you watch now? What do you like now? Who are the young uh what are the shows you like, and who are the comedians you like? Uh, I don't like my answer to this question. Oh. Uh, it's somewhat of an addiction to what's going on, the news. Turn on Chris Hayes at 6 o'clock or so, and he's followed by, uh, by uh, Rachel Maddow, who's followed by... Uh, What's his face? Who's followed by Brian? Lawrence O'Donnell. Lawrence O'Donnell followed What's by What's his Brian. face? And I can sit there for a number of nights watching those shows. And then somebody tells me, have you ever seen Shit's Creek? And then I will. Look. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife is very similar to that. I, I, I get a little, <laughs> I, I have it a little bit up to here at a certain point. And yeah. I, you know, I, I read a little bit. You do that, I know. <laughs> but yeah, I wish I was writing more. I've got to loosen my head to write more. Well, he, here's the thing about writing that uh, I I've written by myself and enjoy that in a different way than I enjoy writing with other people. And I. Listen, you're, you're talking about, I know you wrote for Rowan and Martin. I know you wrote for Martin and Lewis. There used to be teams. I came from a team, Franken and Davis. My, I went to high school with Tom Davis, and we were a team for 20-some years. And uh, there are very few of those now. But when you're on the staff of a show, and all in the family, you had a writing staff, right? Yeah. And, and you break stories and you sit around the table and make each other laugh and work hard actually. And, um, I was talking to Conan O'Brien, I don't know, a couple months ago, the COVID driving so many people crazy. And he said, I went into comedy to be in rooms with funny people. 
Mm. That's why I went into comedy. I love that. And isn't that it? I mean, that's right. To me, it's like that kind of writing is not work. <laughs> that's, I mean, it is sometimes. Sometimes you hit a moment where it's a lot of, I mean, you're working hard. But when it's working, it's not work. It, it, the work, I associate deadlines with work. It's not work until there are deadlines. And when you have to finish something by a certain hour because there are a dozen actors on a stage waiting for the words. That's work. That that can be work. And that's a series. If you're doing a series yeah. that's that that that's happening every week or something, or that's happening a lot. But it's nice to have uh, you know, a script and then a really, you know, a really solid script that has a great table read where everyone's laughing and then you're rewriting and you're, you're, you're feeling really good. Isn't that a, that's a great feeling, right? It's the greatest, the greatest feeling is having worked hard and written a script and then uh, three days of rehearsal, you don't see anything until the third night of rehearsal and you walk in and you see something that kills you that wasn't written, that wasn't in the script at all, the actors and the director found. Oh, my God, what a gift that is. Who who were the actors? Who was the directors? Who who were? Carol O'Connor as Archie and... and, and, uh, and but I mean, who, who came up with stuff? Who were the ones who came up with stuff? If you, if you saw enough of All in the Family, you could remember an argument Mike and... Uh, Archie had they had to sleep together one night. Is this the shoes and the sock? Yes, yes. <laughs> All these years later, Al, you remember that because yeah. it, it was so hilarious. Explain it to the folk because <laughs> I can't. Well, it was they were getting dressed, and uh, and Mike. Uh, saw Archie, or Archie saw Mike put on a sock and a shoe. And he said, you're supposed to put on a sock and a sock and then a shoe and a shoe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, that was three minutes or two and a half minutes of utter hilarity. Gold. Gold. And it was a gift that, the, that they found in rehearsal. Uh, I, also, that's all of this is coming from character. Yes. So that is, uh, you know, the comedy of character, man. That is the key, isn't it? This was a gift of the characters and the actors playing the role. Oh, that was, yes. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) That was a combo of, and you got Rob Reiner, who is, you know, a world-class comedy director, obviously. And, uh, and. Comedy Mind, and Carol Connor, who was a world-class dramatic actor as well. I must have uh, interviewed 30 guys for that role in New York before I flew out to California to do some interviews in L.A., and I don't know when he was a 6th or 10th or 15th L.A. actor who came in to read for me. I mean, he wasn't off the second page before... My heart was pounding. I, I, I remember so clearly. Oh my God! I hope he's available. I hope we can make a deal. I, I and it wasn't like I had like I found Archie that I that it was in my mind when I wrote the script. I don't know. I remember what I had in my mind, but uh, he said he he replaced and, whatever you had in your mind with him. Yes, and. Uh, one one of the great gifts of a career. Who who else? Who uh, of all you know? I mean, you had uh, you know Jimmy Walker, uh, who I did uh, stand up you know at, early on in both of our careers, and that, again that was being and just a funny guy. Just a funny guy. <laughs> there it is. You know. Too- <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
you know, casting is the acceptance of a series of gifts. Hmm. So who knew what I hadn't seen Jimmy Walker in a club or anything. He walked in, read a role, and I couldn't have imagined a Jimmy Walker in a million years, or a Carol O'Connor, or a Gene Stapleton, or mm. a B. Arthur. Well, B. Arthur I knew because we were friends. I'd seen her in many things. Uh, but the gift of what a what a glorious comedic actor can give you in the in a role, I, I think it's a. I, I, it was a gift of birth to be somebody who could appreciate it as much as I've appreciated it, it, it nourished by it as much as I've been nourished by it. Well, okay, you're 98, <laughs> and the and the nourishment. I think is a is a reason for your being ninety eight, <laughs> and I, I saw you at uh, at uh, the Kennedy Center a number I don't know five years ago or something. Yeah, yeah. And you did a thing which just cracked me up, and I, I can't do it as well as you. And I'm probably you, a lot of stuff cracked me up. So you don't. But you said I get applause just doing this because of how old I am. You know what I'm talking about. Probably walking across the stage. That's right. <laughs> Which was so both funny and, of course, everyone burst into applause. But that's what you did. You set it up, and you, we didn't know what you were saying, what what you were about to do. And you just walked, <laughs> and you were probably ninety four <laughs> at that time. Ninety five, spry. Ninety five. Oh my god. So pretty good, pretty good. I hope, uh, okay, you got your uh, first uh, inoculation, and let's, Jesus Christ, hope that all this works, huh? What a time we live in. But I, I don't want to wake up the morning without hope, so. Uh, oh, no, no, no. We have an amazing amount of hope. What I'm saying is every day, they're roll, you know, the Biden team is rolling something out. Yes. That gives us hope. And today it was like, you know, it was basically doing things so that um, people of color can get mortgages, can can get, you know, have a home. I mean, if you look at when you came back from World War II, there was a GI Bill, but black veterans, soldiers coming back, they were redlined and couldn't buy a house. And, uh, you, you know, know, you yeah. mentioned black uh, soldiers. In my missions uh, out of Foggia, Italy, often we experienced the gift of the Tuskegee Airmen escorting us across, well, in their case, right across the, uh, the bomb site because the, the, the fighters flying escort it wasn't necessary for them. They weren't ordered to go across the uh, the bomb zone where the uh, where the missiles from the ground were thickest. But the Tuskegee guys, for the most part, did. And so when we saw those red tails, uh, I remember feeling better, if not literally safer mm -hmm. that's that's something <laughs> yeah. that is really something yeah. man norman man that's beautiful uh thank you <laughs> thank you for a lovely evening there it is there's your dream because i just uh, you couldn't see me but you should have seen I, I wish we could have you could have seen the joy on my face during you singing. You're wrong. I can see you, and I could see you all the way through. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, I mean, I couldn't literally with my eyes see you, but your spirit is so alive in me. I see you very clearly. Uh, you say that to all the podcasts uh, hosts. I, uh, I do, I, and I do. It <laughs> <pretty> <laughs> Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing 
this podcast. We'll talk again next week.